Chapter One of De Lorme. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. De Lorme by G. P. R. James. Chapter One. I was born in the heart of Bern in the year sixteen nineteen, and if the scenery amongst which we first open our eyes and from which we receive our earliest impressions could communicate its own peculiar character to our minds i should certainly have possessed a thousand great and noble qualities that might have taught me to play a very different part from that which i have done in the great tragic farce of human life nevertheless in contemplating the strange contrasts of scenery the gay the sparkling the grand the gloomy the sublime wherein my infant years were passed i have often thought i saw a sort of picture of my own fate with its abrupt and rapid changes and even in some degree of my own character or rather of my own mood varying continually through all the different shades of disposition from the lightest mirth to the most profound gloom from the idlest heedlessness to the most anxious thought however it is not my own peculiar character that i sit down to depict that will be sufficiently displayed in the detail of my adventures but it is rather those strange and singular events which contrary to all probability mingled me with great men and with great actions and which continually counteracting my own will impelled me ever on the very opposite course from that which i struggled to pursue for many reasons it is necessary to commence this narrative with those early years wherein the mind of man receives its first bias when the seeds of all future actions are sown in the heart and when causes in themselves so trifling as almost to be imperceptible chain us to good or evil to fortune or misfortune for ever the character of man is like a piece of potter's clay which when fresh and new is easily fashioned according to the will of those into whose hands it falls but its form once given and hardened either by the slow drying of time or by its passage through the ardent furnace of the world men may break it to atoms but never bend it again to another mould our parents our teachers our companions all serve to modify our dispositions the very proximity of their faults their failings or their virtues leaves as it were an impress on the flexible mind of infancy which the steadiest reason can hardly do more than modify and years themselves can never erase to the events of those early years i owe many of my errors in life and my faults and their consequences are not without their moral for in my history as in that of every other man it will be found that punishment of some kind never failed to tread fast upon the heels of each wrong action and in one instance a few hours of indiscretion mingled a dark and fearful current with the course of many an after year to begin then with the beginning i was as i have said born in the heart of the little mountainous principality of bern which stretching along the northern side of the pyrenees contains within itself some of the most fertile and some of the most picturesque some of the sweetest and some of the grandest scenes that any part of europe can boast the chain of my native mountains interposing between france and spain forms a gigantic wall whereby the unerring hand of nature has marked the limits of either land and although this immense bulwark is in itself scarcely broken by any but very narrow and difficult passes yet the mountainous ridges which it sends off like enormous buttresses into the plain country on each side are intersected by a number of wide and beautiful valleys rich with all the gifts of summer and glowing with all the loveliness of bright fertility one of the most striking though perhaps not one of the most extensive of these valleys is that which running from east to west lies in a direct line between bagnères de bigorre and the little town and castle of lourdes never have i seen and certainly never shall i now see any other valley so sweet so fair so tranquil never one so bright in itself or so surrounded by objects of grandeur and magnificence i need not say after this that it was my native place 
the dwelling of my father roger de l'orme count de bigorre was perched up high upon the hillside about two miles from lourdes and looked far over all the splendid scene below the wide valley with its rich carpet of verdure the river dashing in liquid diamonds amidst the rocks and over the precipices the long far windings of the deep purple mountains filling the mind with vague but grand imaginings the dark majestic shadows of the pine forest that every here and there were cast like a black mantle round the enormous limbs of each giant hill the long wavy perspective of the passes towards Corteretz and the pont d'espagne with the icy vignemar raising up his frozen head as if to dare the full power of the summer sun beyond all was spread out to the eye offering in one grand view a thousand various sorts of loveliness i must be pardoned for dilating upon these sweet scenes of my early childhood whose very memory bestows a calm and placid joy which i have never found in any other spot or in any other feeling neither in the gaiety and splendour of a court the gratification of passion the hurry and energy of political intrigue the excitement and triumph of the battlefield the struggle of conflicting hosts or the maddening thrill of victory but for a moment let me indulge and then i quit such memories for things and circumstances whose interest is more easily communicable to the minds of others the chateau in which my eyes first opened to the light was little inferior in size to the castle of lords and infinitely too large for the small establishment of servants and retainers which my father's reduced finances enabled him to maintain our diminished household looked within its enormous walls like the shrunken form of some careful old miser insinuated into the wide and hanging garments of his youth and yet my excellent parent fondly insisted upon as much pomp and ceremony as his own father had kept up with a hundred and fifty retainers waiting in his hall still the trumpet sounded at the hour of dinner though the weak lungs of the broken-winded old maitre d'hôtel produced but a cacophonous sound from the hollow brass still all the servants who amounted to five including the gardener the shepherd and the cook were drawn up at the foot of the staircase in unstarched ruffs and tarnished liveries of green and gold while my father with slow and solemn pace handed down to dinner madame la comtesse still would he talk of his vassals and his seigneurial rights though his domain scarce covered five hundred acres of wood and mountain and vassals god knows he had but few however the banners still hung in the hall and it was impossible to gaze upon the walls the pinnacles the towers and the battlements of the old castle without attaching the idea of power and influence to the lord of such a hold so that it was not extraordinary he himself should in some particulars forget the decay of his house and fancy himself as great as his ancestors a thousand excellent qualities of the heart covered any little foibles in my father's character he was liberal to a fault kind with that minute and discriminating benevolence which weighs every word ere it be spoken lest it should hurt the feelings of another brave to that degree that scarcely believes in fear yet at the same time so humane that his sympathy with others often proved the torture of his own heart but oh that in this world there should still be a but to qualify everything that is good and excellent but still he had one fault that served greatly to counteract all the high qualities which he possessed he was invincibly lazy in mind he could endure nothing that gave him trouble and though the natural quickness of his disposition would lead him to purpose a thousand great undertakings yet long ere the time came for executing them various little obstacles and impediments had gradually worn down his resolution or else the trouble of thinking about one thing for long was too much for him and the enterprise dropped by its own weight had fortune brought him great opportunities no one would have seized them more willingly or used them to better or nobler purposes but fortune was to seek and he did nothing the wars of the league in which his father had taken a considerable part had gradually lopped away branch after branch of our estates and even hewn deeply into the trunk 
and my father was not a man either by active enterprise or by court intrigue to mend the failing fortunes of his family on the contrary after having served in two campaigns and distinguished himself in several battles out of pure weariness he retired to our chateau of de Lorme, where being once fixed in quiet he passed the rest of his days never having courage to undertake a longer journey than to pau or to tarbes and forming in his solitude a multitude of fine and glorious schemes which fell to nothing almost in the same moment that they were erected as we may see a child build up with a pack of cards many a high and ingenious structure which the least breath of air will instantly reduce the same flat nonentities from which they were reared at the first my mother's character is soon told it was all excellence or if there was indeed in its composition one drop of that evil from which human nature is probably never entirely free it consisted in a touch of family pride and yet while i write it my heart reproaches me and says that it was not so however the reader shall judge by the sequel and if she had this fault it was her only one and all the rest was virtue and gentleness restricted as were her means of charity still every one that came within the sphere of her influence experienced her kindness or partook of her bounty nor was her charity alone the charity that gives it was the charity that feels that excuses that forgives a willing aid in all that was amiable and benevolent was to be found in good father francis of Alourdi, the chaplain of the chateau in his young days they said he had been a soldier and on some slight received from a world for which he was too good he threw away the corslet and took the gown not with the feeling of a misanthrope but of a philanthropist for many years he remained as cure at the little village of Alourdi in the val d'osso but his sight and his strength both failing him and the cure being an arduous one he resigned it to a younger man who he thought might better perform the duties of the station and brought as gentle a heart and as pure a spirit as ever rested in a mortal frame to dwell with the two others i have described in the chateau de Lorme. it may be asked if he too had his foible believe me dear reader whoever thou art that every one on this earth has some nor was he without one and strange as it may appear his was superstition i say strange as it may appear for he was a man of a strong and vigorous mind calm reflective rational without any of that hurried and perturbed indistinctness of judgment which suffers imagination to usurp the place of reason but still he was superstitious to a great degree affording a striking instance of that union of opposite qualities which every one who takes the trouble of examining his own bosom will find more or less exemplified in himself his superstition however grew in a mild and benevolent soil and was indeed but as one of those tender climbing plants which hang upon the ruined tower or the shattered oak and close them with a verdure not their own thus he fondly adhered to the imaginative tenets of ancient days fast falling into decay he peopled the air with spirits and in his fancy gave them visible shapes and in some degree even corporeal qualities however on an ardent and youthful mind like mine such picturesque superstitions were most likely to have effect and so far indeed did they influence me that though reason in after-life exerted her power to sweep them all away imagination often rebelled and clung fondly to the delusion still such as i have described them were the denizens of the chateau de Lorme at the time of my birth which was unmarked by any other peculiarity than that of my mother having been married and yet childless for more than eight years the joy which the unexpected birth of an heir produced may easily be imagined though little indeed was the inheritance which i came to claim all with one consent gave themselves up to hope and to gladness and more substantial signs of rejoicing were displayed in the hall than the chateau had known for many a day my father declared that i should infallibly retrieve the fortunes of my house father francis with tears in his eyes claimed that it was evidently a blessing from heaven and even my mother discovered that 
though futurity was still misty and indistinct there was now a landmark to guide on hope across the wide ocean of the years to come End of chapter one Chapter Two of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. I know not by what letters patent the privilege is held, but it seems clearly established that the parents of an only child have full right and liberty to spoil him to whatsoever extent they may please. And though my grandfathers on both sides of the house being dead long before my birth, I wanted the usual chief aiders and abettors of over-indulgence. Yet, in consideration of my being an unexpected gift, my father thought himself entitled to expend more unrestricted fondness upon me than if my birth had taken place at an earlier period of his marriage. My education was in consequence somewhat desultory. The persuasions of Father Francis, indeed, often won me, for a time, to study and the wishes of my mother, whose word was ever law to her son, made me perhaps attend to the instructions of the good old priest more than my natural volatility would have otherwise admitted. At times, too, the mad spirit of laughing and jesting at everything, which possessed me from my earliest youth, would suddenly and unaccountably be changed into the most profound pensiveness, and reading would become a delight and a relief. I thus acquired a certain knowledge of Latin and Greek, the first principles of mathematics, and a great many of those absurd and antiquated theories which were taught in that day under the name of philosophy. But from Father Francis also, I learned what should always form one principal branch of a child's education, a very tolerable knowledge of my native language, which I need not say is, in general, spoken in Bern, in the most corrupt and barbarous manner. Thus, very irregularly, proceeded the course of my mental instruction. My corporeal education my father took upon himself, and as his laziness was of the mind rather than the body, he taught me thoroughly, from my very infancy, all those exercises which, according to his conception, were necessary to make a perfect cavalier. I could ride, I could shoot, I could fence, I could wrestle, before I was twelve years old, and of course the very nature of these lessons tended to harden and confirm a frame originally strong, and a constitution little susceptible of disease. The buoyancy of youth, the springy vigour of my muscles, and a good deal of imaginative feeling gave me a sort of indescribable passion for adventure from my childhood, which required even the stimulus of danger to satisfy. Had I lived in the olden time, I had certainly been a knight-errant. Everything that was wild and strange and even fearful was to me delight, and it needed many a hard morsel from the rough hand of the world to quell such a spirit's appetite for excitement. To climb the highest pinnacles of the rocks, to plunge into the deepest caverns, to stand on the very brink of the precipices and look down into the dizzy void below, to hang above the cataract on some tottering stone, and gaze upon the frantic fury of the river boiling in the pools beneath, till my eye was wearied and my ear deafened with the flashing whiteness of the stream, and the thundering roar of its fall. These were the enjoyments of my youth, and many, I am afraid, were the anxious pangs which my temerity inflicted on the bosom of my mother. I will pass over all the little accidents and misadventure of youth, but on one circumstance, which occurred when I was about twelve years old, I must dwell more particularly, inasmuch as it was not only of import at the time, but also affected all my future life by its consequences. On a fine, clear summer morning, I had risen in one of those thoughtful moods, which rarely cloud the sunny mind of youth, but which, as I have said, frequently succeeded to my gayest moments. And walking slowly down the side of the hill, I took my way through the windings of a deep glen that led far into the heart of the mountain. I was well acquainted with this spot, and wandered on almost unconsciously, with scarcely more attention to any external object than a casual glance to the rocks that lay tossed about on either side, amidst a profusion of shrubs and flowers, and trees of every hue and leaf. 
the path ran along on a high bank of rocks overhanging the river which dashing in and out around a thousand stony promontories and over a thousand bright cascades gradually collected its waters into a fuller body and flowed on in a deep swift stream towards a more profound fall below at the side of the cataract the most industrious of all the universe's insects man had taken advantage of the combination of stream and precipice and fixed a small mill-wheel under the full jet of water the clacking sound of which mingling with the murmur of the stream and the savage scenery around communicated strange undefined sensations to my mind associating all the cheerful ideas of human proximity with the wild grandeur of rude uncultivated nature i was too young to unravel my feelings or trace the sources of pleasure i experienced but getting to the very verge of the rock a little way above the mill i stood watching the dashing eddies as they hurried on to be precipitated down the fall and listened to the various sounds that came floating on the air on what impulse i forget at this moment but after gazing for some time i put my foot still farther towards the edge of the rocky stone on which i stood and bent over looking down the side of the bank the stone was a detached fragment of grey marble lying somewhat loosely upon the edge of the descent my weight overthrew its balance it tottered i made a violent effort to recover myself but in vain the rock rolled over and i was pitched headlong into the stream the agony of finding myself irretrievably gone the dazzle and the flash of the water as it closed over my head the thousand regrets that whirled through my brain during the brief moment that i was below the surface the struggle of renewed hope as i rose again and beheld the blue sky and the fair face of nature are all as deeply graven on my memory as if the whole had occurred but yesterday although all panting when i got my head above the water i succeeded in uttering a loud shout for assistance while i struggled to keep myself up with my hand but as i had never learned to swim i soon sunk again and on rising a second time my strength was so far gone i could but give voice to a feeble cry though i saw myself drifting quickly towards the mill and the waterfall where death seemed inevitable my only hope was that the miller would hear me but to my dismay i found that my call though uttered with all the power i had left was far too faint to rise above the roar of the cascade and the clatter of the mill wheels hope gave way and ceasing to struggle i was letting myself sink when i caught a faint glimpse of some one running down amongst the rocks towards me but at that moment in spite of my renewed efforts the water overwhelmed me again for an instant there was an intolerable sense of suffocation a ringing in my ears and a flashing of light in my eyes that was very dreadful but it passed quickly away and a sweet dreamy sensation came over me as if i had been walking in green fields i did not well know where the fear and the struggle were all gone and gradually losing remembrance of everything i seemed to fall asleep such is all that my memory has preserved of the sensations i experienced in drowning a death generally considered a very dreadful one but which is in reality anything but painful we have no means of judging what is suffered in almost any other manner of passing from the world but were i to speak from what i myself felt in the circumstances i have detailed i should certainly say that it is the fear that is the death my next remembrance is of a most painful tingling spreading itself through every part of my body even to my very heart without any other consciousness of active being till at length opening my eyes i found myself lying in a large barely furnished room in the mill with a multitude of faces gazing at me some strange and some familiar amongst the last of which i perceived the pimpled nose of the old maitre d'hotel and the mild countenance of father francis of Alurdi. my father too was there and i remember seeing him with his arms folded on his breast and his eyes straining upon me as if his whole soul was in them when i opened mine he raised his look towards heaven and a tear rolled over his cheek but i saw or heard little of what passed for an irresistible sensation of weariness came over me 
and the moment after I awoke from the sleep of death, I fell into a quiet and refreshing slumber, very different from the cold obstruction of the others. I will pass over all the rejoicing that signalized my recovery, my father's joy, my mother's thanks and prayers, the servants' carousing, and the potations, deep and strong, of the pimple-nosed maître d'hôtel, whose hatred of water never demonstrated itself more strongly than the day after I had escaped drowning. As soon as I had completely regained my strength, my mother told me that after having shown our gratitude to God, it became our duty to show our gratitude also to the person who had been the immediate means of saving me from destruction. And it was then that I learned that I owed my life to the courage and skill of a lad but little older than myself, the son of a poor procurer or attorney at Lourdes. He had been fishing in the stream at the time the rock gave way under my feet, and seeing my fall hurried to save me. With much difficulty and danger he accomplished his object, and having drawn me from the water, carried me to the mill, where he remained only long enough to see me open my eyes, retiring modestly the moment he was assured of my safety. In those young days, life was to me so bright a plaything, all the wheels of existence moved so easily, there was so much beauty in the world, so much delight in being, that my most enthusiastic gratitude was sure to follow such a service as that I had received. Readily did I assent to my mother's proposal that she should accompany me to Lourdes, to offer our thanks, not as with the world in general, in mere empty words, as unsubstantial as the air that bears them, but by some more lasting mark of our gratitude. Upon the nature of the recompense she was to offer, she held a long consultation with my father, who, unwilling to give anything minute consideration, left it entirely to her own judgment, promising the fullest acquiescence in whatever she should think fit. And accordingly we set out early the next day for Lourdes, my mother mounted on a hawking palfrey, and I riding by her side on a small fleet limousin horse, which my father had given me a few days before. This was not, indeed, the equipage with which the Countess de Bigorre should have visited a town once under the dominion of her husband's ancestors, but what was to be done? A carriage, indeed, we had, which would have held six, and if required, eight persons, though the gilding was somewhat tarnished, and a few industrious spiders had spun their delicate nets in the windows, and were between the spokes of the wheels. Neither were horses wanting, for on the side of the mountain were eight coursers, with tails and manes as long as the locks of a mermaid, and a plentiful supply of hair to correspond about their feet. They were somewhat aged indeed, and for the last six years they had gone about slipshod amongst the hills, enjoying the otium cum dignitate, which neither men nor horses often find. Still, they would have done, but where were we to find the six men dressed in the colours of the family, necessary to protect the footboard behind? Where the four stout cavaliers, armed up to their teeth, to ride by the side of the carriage? Where the postillions? Where the coachmen? My mother did much more wisely than strive for a pomp which we were never to see again. She went quietly and simply to discharge what she considered a duty, with as little ostentation as possible, and when the worthy maître d'hôtel lamented, with the familiarity of long service, that the Countess de Bigot should go without such a retinue as in his day had always made the name respected, she replied quietly that those who were as proud of the name as she was would find no retinue needful to make it respectable. My father retired into his library, as we were about to depart, saying to my mother that he hoped she had commanded such a body of retainers to accompany her as she thought necessary. She merely replied that she had, and set out with a single groom to hold the horses, and a boy to show us the way to the dwelling of the procureur. Let it be observed that, up to the commencement of the year of which I speak, Lords had never been visited with the plague of an attorney. But at that epoch, the father of the lad who had saved my life, and who, like him, was named Jean-Baptiste Arnaud, 
had come to settle in that place, much to the horror and astonishment of the inhabitants. He had, it was rumoured, been originally intendant, or steward, to some nobleman in Poitou, and having, by means best known to himself, obtained the charge of procureur in Bern, he had first visited Pau, and thence removed to Lourdes. The name of an attorney had at first frightened the good Bernois of that town, but they soon discovered that Maître Jean-Baptiste Arnaud was a very clever, quiet, amiable little man, about two cubits in height, of which stature his head monopolised at least the moiety. He was not particularly handsome, but as he appeared to have other better qualities, that did not much signify, and they gradually made him their friend, their confidant, and their adviser, in all of which capacities he acted in a mild, tranquil, easy little manner that seemed quite delightful. But notwithstanding all this, the people of the town of Lourdes began insensibly to get of a quarrelsome and a litigious turn, so that Jean-Baptiste Arnaud had his study in general pretty full of clients, and though he made it appear clearly to the most common understanding that his sole object was to promote peace and goodwill, yet, strange to say, Discord, the faithful jackal of all attorneys, was a very constant attendance on his steps. Such were the reports that had reached us at the Chateau de Lorme, and the maître d'hôtel, when he repeated them, laid his finger upon the side of his prominent and rubicund proboscis, and screwed up his eye till it nearly suffered an eclipse, saying as plainly as nose and eye could say, Monsieur Jean-Baptiste Arnaud is a cunning fellow. However, my father had no will to believe ill of any one, and my mother as little, so that when we set out for Lourdes, both were fully convinced that the parent of their child's deliverer was one of the most excellent of men. After visiting the church and offering at the shrine of Notre-Dame de Bon Secours, we proceeded to the dwelling of the procureur, and, dismounting from our horses, entered the étude, or office, of the lawyer. The boy, who had come to show us the way, throwing open the door with a consequential fling, calculated to impress the mind of the attorney with the honour which we did him. It was a miserable chamber, with a low table and a few chairs, both strewed with some books of law, and written papers, greased and browned by the continual thumbing of the coarse-handed peasants, in whose concerns they were written. Jean-Baptiste Arnaud was not there, but in his place appeared a person, plainly dressed in a suit of black, with buttons of jet, without any embroidery or ornament whatever. He wore a pair of riding-boots with immense tops, shaped like a funnel, according to the mode of the day, and the dust upon these appendages, as well as the disordered state of his long wavy hair, seemed to announce that he had ridden far, while a large sombrero hat and a long steel-hilted Toledo sword, which lay beside him, led the mind naturally to conclude that his journey had been from Spain. To judge of his station by his dress, one would have concluded him to be some Spanish merchant of no very large fortune, but his person and his air told a different tale. Pale and even rather sallow in complexion, the high, broad forehead rising almost upright from his brow, and seen still higher through the floating curls of his dark hair, the straight, finely turned nose, the small mouth curled with a sort of smile, strangely mingled of various expressions, half cynical, half bland, the full rounded chin, the very turn of his head and neck, as he sat writing at the table exactly opposite the door, all gave that nobility to his aspect which was not to be mistaken. At our entrance the stranger rose, and in answer to my mother's inquiry for the procureur, replied, Arnaud is not at present here, but if the Countess de Bigot will sit down, he shall attend her immediately. And taking up the letter he had been writing, he left the apartment. The moment after the door by which he had gone out again opened, and Jean-Baptiste Arnaud entered the room, at once verifying by his appearance everything we had heard of his person. He was quite a dwarf in stature, and, in size at least, Dame Nature had certainly very much favoured his head, at the expense of the rest of his body. 
his face to my youthful eyes appeared at least two feet square with all the features in proportion except the eyes which were peculiarly small and black and not being very regularly set in his head seemed like two small boats nearly lost in the vast ocean of countenance which lay before us i do not precisely remember the particulars of the conversation which took place upon his coming in but i very well recollect laughing most amazingly at his appearance in spite of my mother's reproof and telling him with the unceremonious candour of a spoiled child that he was certainly the ugliest man i had ever seen he affected to take my boldness in very good part and called me a fine frank boy but there was a vindictive gleam in his little black eyes which contradicted his words and i have since had reason to believe that he never forgot or forgave my childish rudeness it is a very general rule that a man is personally vain in proportion to his ugliness and hates the truth in the same degree that he deceives himself certain it is no man was ever more ugly or ever more vain and his conceit had not been nourished a little by marrying a very handsome woman of course the first object of conversation which arose between my mother and himself was the service which his son had rendered me and as a recompense she offered that the young jean baptiste should be received into the chateau de rome and educated with its heir which she considered as the highest honour that could be conferred on the young Lourturier. and in the second place she promised in the name of my father that five hundred livres per annum should be settled upon him for life a sum of no small importance in those days and in that part of the country the surprise and gratitude of the attorney can hardly be properly expressed of liberality he had not in his own bosom one single idea and i verily believe that at first he thought my mother had some sinister object in the proposals which she made but speedily recovering himself he accepted with great readiness the pension that was offered to his son at the same time hesitating a good deal in regard to sending him to the chateau de l'orme he enlarged upon his sense of the honour and the favour and the condescension but his son he said was the only person he had who could act as his clerk and he was afraid he could not continue his business without him in short his objections hurt my mother's pride and she was rising with an air of dignity to put an end to the matter by taking her departure when as if by a sudden thought the procureur besought her to stay one moment and as her bounty had already been so great perhaps she would extend it one degree farther his son he said was absolutely necessary to him to carry on his business but he had one daughter whom her mother being dead he had no means of educating as he could wish if said he madame la comtesse de bigorre will transfer the benefit she intended for my son to his sister she will lay my whole family under an everlasting obligation and i will take it upon myself to affirm that the disposition and talents of the child are such as will do justice to the kindness of her benefactress these words he pronounced in a loud voice and then starting up as if to cut across all deliberation on the subject he said he would call both his children and left the room after having been absent some time he returned with the lad who had saved my life and a little girl of about ten years old jean baptiste the younger was at this time about fifteen and though totally unlike his father in stature in make or in mind he had still a sufficient touch of the old procureur in his countenance to justify his mother in the matter of paternity not so the little helen whose face was certainly not the reflection of her father's if such he was her long soft dark eyes alone were sufficient to have overset the whole relationship without even the glossy brown hair that curled round her brow the high clear forehead the mouth like twin cherries or the brilliant complexion which certainly put monsieur arnaud's coffee-coloured skin very much out of countenance her manners were as sweet and gentle as her person my mother's heart was soon won and the exchange proposed readily conceded the young jean baptiste was thanked both by my mother and myself in all the terms we could find to express our gratitude 
all which he received in a good-humoured and yet a sheepish manner, as if he were at once gratified and distressed by the commendations that were showered upon him. Helen, it was agreed, should be brought over to the chateau the next day, and having now acquitted ourselves of the debt of obligation under which we had lain, we again mounted our horses and rode away from Lourdes. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Though I have not gone very far into my history, I have learned to hate being my own historian, stringing I and I and I together to the end of the chapter. Nevertheless, I believe that no man's history can be so well told as by himself, if he will but be candid for no one can so completely enter into his feelings or have so vivid an impression of the circumstances amidst which he has acted notwithstanding this it shall be my endeavour to pass over the events of my youth as rapidly as possible for the purpose of arriving at that part of this history where the stirring nature of the scenes in which i mingled may cover the egotism of the detail but still as there are persons and occurrences yet unmentioned by which my after-life was entirely modified, I must still pause a little on this part of my tale. Faithful to the charge she had undertaken, my mother made the education of Helen Arnault her particular care. At first she confined her instructions to those arts alone which were likely to be useful to her in the bourgeoise class in which she had been born. But there was a degree of ready genius mixed with the infinite gentleness of Helen's disposition, which gradually seduced my mother into teaching her much more than she had at first intended. Nor was she ill-qualified for the task, possessing every female accomplishment, both mental and corporeal, in as much perfection as they had received in those days. At first the education of the sweet girl, thus placed under her protection, formed a sort of amusement for her, when my father and myself were absent in any of the long rides we used to take through the country. Gradually it became so habitual as to be necessary to her comfort, and Helen so completely wound herself round the Countess's heart that she could not bear to be without her for any considerable length of time. Perhaps it was the very attachment which she herself experienced towards Helen that made my mother feel how strong might be the effect of such sweetness and such beauty at some after time upon the heart of an ardent, sensitive, imaginative youth and my mother from the first knew me to be such. Whatever was the cause, certain it is she took care that between Helen and myself should be placed a barrier of severe and chilling formality, calculated to repress the least intimacy in its very bud. Whenever she mentioned my name to her young protégé, it was always under the ceremonious epithet of Count Louis. Whenever I entered the room, Helen Arnault was sent away upon some excuse which prevented her return, or, if she was permitted to remain, there was a sort of courtly etiquette maintained, well calculated to freeze all the warmer blood of youth. All this my mind has commented on since, though I only regarded it at the time as something very disagreeable, without in the least understanding why my mother chose to play so very different a part from that which suited her natural character. She certainly acted for the best, but I think she was mistaken in her judgment of the means to be employed for effecting her object. It is probable that had she suffered me at the first to look upon Helen Arnault as a sister, and taught her to consider me as her brother, the feelings which we acquired towards each other at ten and twelve years old would have remained unchanged at a later period. God knows how it would have been. I am afraid that all experiments upon young hearts are dangerous things. The only remedy is, I believe, a stone wall, and the example of Pyramus and Thisbe demonstrates that even it must not have a crack in it. As it was, the years rolled on, and I began to acquire the sensations of manhood. I saw Helen Arnault but by glimpses, but I saw nothing on earth so lovely. Every day new beauties broke forth upon me, and it was impossible to behold her hour by hour expanding into the perfection of womanhood 
without experiencing those feelings with which we see a bud open out into the rose a wish to possess so beautiful a thing in the meanwhile several changes took place in our vicinity the most important of which was the arrival of a neighbour the chateau de l'orme stood as i have said upon the side of the hill commanding an extensive view through the valley below it had originally been nothing more than one of those towers to be found in every gorge of the pyrenees built in times long past to defend the country from the incursions of the moors of spain after the expulsion of the infidels from the peninsula it had been converted into a hunting residence for the counts of bigor and a great many additions had been made to it according to the various tastes of a long line of proprietors who had each in general followed the particular style of architecture which accorded with its own immediate pursuits the more warlike had built towers and walls and turrets and battlements one of the counts dying without children it had fallen into the hands of his brother who was a bishop he added a gothic chapel and a dormitory for ecclesiastics his nephew a famous lawyer and president de grenoble no sooner succeeded than he built an immense hall exactly copied from the hall of justice in which he had so often presided and others of different dispositions had equally taken care of the stables the dairy and the kitchen in short they had been like the fairies called to the birth of a child in our nursery tales each had endowed the building with some particular gift so that on the whole though somewhat straggling and irregular it contained an apartment of every kind sort and description that could be wanted or wished for in one of the square towers built upon the edge of a steep rock some ninety feet in height my father had fixed his library here he could read whatever book he chose in a quiet dozy sort of manner without hearing any noise from the rest of the house though at the same time he just caught through the open windows the murmuring of the waterfall below and could look up from what he was perusing and run his eye through all the windings of the valley with a dreamy contemplative listlessness in which he was very fond to indulge at about a quarter of a mile from the chateau and amongst the first objects within the scope of my father's view as he sat in this library was a small house which had belonged to some of the wealthier retainers of the family when it had been in its flush prosperity this had since passed into the hands of a farmer at the time that my grandfather had judged proper to diminish the family estate and expend its current representative in gunpowder and cannonballs but a year or two before the time to which i refer it had become vacant by the death of its occupier and had remained shut up ever since little care being taken to keep this house in repair it formed a sort of eyesore in my father's view and regularly every month he declared he would repurchase it and arrange it according to his own taste with a degree of energy and even vehemence of manner which would have led any one who did not know him to suppose that within an hour the purchase would be completed and the alterations put in train but the moment he had shut the library door behind him he began to think of something else and before he was in the courtyard he had forgotten all about it one morning however he was not a little surprised to see the windows of the house opened and two or three workmen of various kinds employed in rendering it habitable without giving himself time to recover from his astonishment or to forget the change he sent down the lackey to inquire the name of its new occupier and in short the whole particulars how the man executed his commission i know not but the reply was that the chevalier de montenero would do himself the honour of waiting upon the count de bigor my father said very well and resolved to have everything prepared to receive this new neighbour with ceremony but finding that the arrangements required a good deal of thought he resolved to leave them all to my mother and was proceeding to her apartments for the purpose of casting the weight of it upon her shoulders when in the corridor he met little helen arnault who had then been with us about six months began playing with and caressing her forgot the chevalier de montenero and went out to ride with me towards bigor on our return we found a strong iron grey horse saddled in the courtyard and were informed that the chevalier de montenero was in the apartments of madame la comtesse on following my father thither i instantly recognised the person we had seen in the etude 
of the procureur de l'ordre the sight i will own was a pleasing one to me for from the moment i had first beheld him i had wished to hear and see more there was a sort of dignity in his aspect that struck my boyish imagination and captivated me in a way i cannot account for i am well aware that on every principle of right reasoning the theory of innate sympathies is one of the most ridiculous that ever the theory-mongers of this earth produced but yet though strange it is no less a fact which every one must have felt that there are persons whom we meet in the world and who without one personal beauty to attract and even before we have had any opportunity of judging of their minds obtain a sort of hold upon our feelings and imagination more powerful than long acquaintance with their qualities of mind could produce perhaps it may proceed from some association between their persons and our preconceived ideas of goodness the chevalier de montenero however in his youth must have been remarkable for personal beauty and the strongest traces of it remained even yet though in this respect years had been the less merciful inasmuch as they had been leagued with care deep lines of painful and anxious thought were evident on the chevalier's forehead and in his cheek but it was not thought of a mean or sordid nature the grandeur of his brow the erect unshrinking dignity of his carriage all contradicted it powerful or rather overpowering passions might perchance speak forth in the flash of his dark eye but the expression for good or bad was still great and elevated there was something also that might be called impenetrable in his air it was that of a man long accustomed to bury matters of much import deep in his own bosom and very few i believe would have liked to ask him an impertinent question in manner he was mild and grave and though his name was evidently spanish and his whole dress and appearance betrayed that he had very lately arrived from that country yet he spoke our language with perfect facility and without the slightest foreign accent i believe the pleasure i felt in seeing him again showed itself in somewhat of youthful gladness and as he was not a man to despise anything that was pure and unaffected he seemed gratified by my remembrance and invited me to visit him in his solitude i mean madame said he turning to my mother to make the house which i have bought in the valley a hermitage in almost everything but the name but if you will occasionally permit your son to cheer it with his company i shall be the happier in the society of one who as yet is certainly uncorrupted by this bad world and in return he may perhaps learn from me some of that law which long commerce with my fellow-creatures and such familiarity with great and strange events have taught me i eagerly seized on the permission and from that day whenever my mood turned towards the serious and the thoughtful my steps naturally followed the path towards the dwelling of the chevalier i may say that i won his affection and much did he strive to correct and guide my disposition to high and noble objects marking keenly every propensity in my nature and endeavouring to direct them aright there was a charm in his conversation an impressive truth in all he said that both persuaded and convinced and had i followed the lessons of wisdom i heard from his lips i should have been both happier and better in my after-life but the struggle of youthful passion was ever too strong for reason and for many years of my being i was but a creature of impulse carried away by the wish of the moment and forgetting at the time i most needed them all the resolutions i had founded upon the experience of others the chevalier evidently saw and regretted the wildness of my disposition but i do not think he loved me the less there was something in it that harmonized with his own character for often notwithstanding all that he had learned in the impressive school of the world the original enthusiasm of his heart would shine out in spite of the veil of stern coldness with which he covered his warmer feelings this i remarked afterwards but suffice it in this place to say that his regard for me assumed a character of almost paternal tenderness which i ever repaid by a respect and reverence i am afraid more than filial in his manners to every one but the members of our family he was distant and cold but it seemed as if towards us his heart had expanded from the first my mother he would often visit 
behaving on such occasions with the calm, elegant attention of high-bred courtesy, never stiffening into coldness or sinking into familiarity. With my father he would sit for many hours at a time, conversing over various subjects of life and morals, with which, even to my young mind, it was apparent that he was actively and practically acquainted. Why my father, though perhaps his reasoning was as good, spoke evidently but from what he had read and what he had heard, without the clear precision of personal knowledge. Other acquaintances, also, though of an inferior class, and very different character, must now be mentioned, though neither their habits of life or rank in society were calculated to throw much lustre on those who any way consorted with them. The excessive height to which the gabelle had carried the price of salt acted as one of the greatest encouragements to those Spanish smugglers who have in all times frequented the various passes of the Pyrenees, and distinguished themselves by a daring and reckless courage, and a keen, penetrating sagacity, which might have raised them individually to the highest stations of society, if employed for the nobler and better purposes of existence. It unfortunately happens in the world that talent is less frequently wanting than the wisdom to employ it, and many men who, to my knowledge, might have established their own fortune, served their country, and rendered their name immortal, have wasted grand abilities upon petty schemes, and heroic courage upon disgraceful enterprises. So was it, though in a minor degree, with many of the Spanish smugglers that were continually passing to and fro in our immediate neighbourhood, and a braver or more ingenious race of men never existed. Of course they were not without their aiders and abettors on the French side of the mountains, and it was very generally supposed that the mill, near which I had fallen into the water, was a great receptacle for the contraband goods which they imported. However, nothing of the kind was to be discovered, although the officers of the gabelle, called gabelleteurs, and the douaniers, or custom-house officers, had visited it at all times and seasons. The mill had never been found clear and fair, and the miller, a quiet, civil sort of person, who let them look where they listed, and took it all in good part. Notwithstanding all this fair appearance, which baffled even the keen eyes of those interested in the discovery, and deceived completely all who were not interested in the smuggling itself, whenever my father wanted some good Alicante wine, or Xeres, or anything else of the same nature, he sent to the miller, who was always found ready to oblige Monsignor le Comte. Often also, in my childhood, did I visit the mill in company with the old maître d'hôtel, whose predilection for the good things of this life, especially in the form of liquids, would have led him to cultivate the acquaintance of the devil himself, if he had appeared with a bottle of wine under his arm. Many was the curious scene that I thus saw, now floating faintly before my memory as a remembered dream, and many were the means employed to make the amiable practice of smuggling palatable to the taste of the air of Bigorre. Oranges and pomegranates and dates were always brought forward to gratify the young Count, and my bold and daring spirit, even as a child, excited the admiration and delight of many of the dark smugglers, who used in return to tell me long stories of their strange adventures, which, heightened by the barbarous yet picturesque dialect that they spoke, excited my fancy to the utmost, and sent me away with my brain full of wild imaginations. Very often, if any of these men had something peculiarly rare or curious to dispose of, they went so far as to bring it up to the Chateau de Lorme, where my father generally became a purchaser, notwithstanding a remonstrance which my mother would occasionally venture to make, against the encouragement of persons habitually infringing the law of the land. Our family thus acquired the reputation amongst the smugglers of being their patrons and benefactors, and violent in all their passions, whether good or bad, their gratitude was enthusiastic in proportion. One of them, named Pedro Garcias, deserves more particular notice than the rest on many accounts. When I first knew him, he was a man of about forty, perhaps more, but time and danger, and excited passion and fatigue, had made as little impression upon him as the soft waves of some sheltered bay do upon the granite rocks that surround it. He was born at the little village of Haka, 
on the other side of the mountains the son of a wealthy farmer who afforded him an education much superior to his rank in life the blood of his ancestors they said was mingled with that of the moors but instead of feeling this circumstance as a stain upon his race like most of his countrymen he seemed rather to glory in his descent from a valiant and conquering people and to exult in the african fire that circled in his veins his complexion was not peculiarly swarthy though his long stiff black hair and flashing eyes spoke out in favour of his moorish origin in height he was nearly six feet three inches but instead of any of the awkward disproportion which we sometimes see in tall people his form was cast in the most exquisite mould of vigorous masculine beauty there existed between his mind and person that similarity which we more frequently find amongst the uncultivated children of nature than where education has changed the character or impeded its development his intellect and all his perceptions were strong powerful and active with a certain cast of fearless grandeur about them that gave something great and fine even to the employment he had chosen his disposition also was quick hasty and unsparing but full of a rude enthusiastic generosity that would have taught him to die for those he considered his friends and also a bold dignity which led him to trust to daring more than cunning he had in his nature much of the beast of prey but it was of the nobler kind heaven knows how with so many qualities of mind and person qualities calculated to raise him above rather than sink him below the station in which he was born heaven knows how he fell into the perilous but inglorious life of a simple contrabandisto between france and spain this man was one of the smugglers who most frequently visited the chateau and it sometimes happened that the intermediation of the old maitre d'hôtel was dispensed with and that he would be admitted to the audience of my father himself which generally lasted a considerable time for garcias possessed that sort of natural eloquence which mingled with a degree of caustic humour was sure to command attention and to engage without wearying there was something too in his very appearance that attracted and interested certainly never was a more picturesque i may say a more striking figure seen than he presented as i have beheld him often coming down amongst the mountains whose child he seemed to be his long black hair gathered into a net under his broad sombrero his cloak of chequered cloth mantling all the upper part of his figure and only leaving free the left hip with the steel hilt of his sword and the right arm ready to make use of it while his legs whose swelling muscles told of their gigantic strength appeared striding underneath covered to the knees with the tight elastic silk breeches of the aragonese mountaineers the rest of his dress generally consisted of a brown cloth jacket a crimson sash round his waist containing his pistols and a long knife white stockings and a pair of mountain sandals made of untowned cowhide laced up to his ankle such were the various persons that surrounded me in my youth and such indeed were the only ones with whom i had any communication except the young jean baptiste arnaud who used to come frequently to see his sister her father troubled himself very little about her after she was once fairly under the protection of my mother but her brother was not so remiss and whenever he came was received with kindness by all the family not suffered to depart without some little token of regard for my own part the memory of the service he had rendered me remained ever upon my mind and showed itself in every way that my youthful imagination could devise till at length the good simple-hearted lad from the person obliging began to feel himself de obliged and both feelings mingling in his heart together produced towards me the most generous and disinterested attachment i have said that i was between twelve and thirteen years old when helen arnaud first became an inmate of the same dwelling two years rapidly passed by and not long after i had reached the age of fourteen i was sent to the college of Po, where three years and a half more glided away in unperturbed tranquillity calm quiet slow but what a change had taken place in all my thoughts and feelings by the time they had passed i was farther advanced both in stature in form and ideas than most youths of my age 
Childhood was gone. Manhood was at hand. I left the placid, innocent bowers of infancy, with their cool and passionless shades, and I stood with my footsteps on the threshold of man's busy and tumultuous theatre, ready to plunge into the arena and struggle with the rest. My heart full of strong and ardent passions, my imagination vivid and uncontrolled, with some knowledge gained from books and some shrewd sense of my own, but with little self-government and no experience, I set out from Po to return to my paternal mansion, and as from that day I may date the commencement of a new existence, I will pause and begin my manhood with a chapter to itself. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of De Law by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. I was now eighteen, slim, tall, and vigorous, inheriting some portion of both my father's and of my mother's personal beauty, and superadding all those graces which are peculiarly the property of youth, the flowers which partial nature bestows upon the spring of life and which are rarely compensated by the fruits of manhood's summer. I know not why I should refrain from saying I was handsome. Long before any one reads these lines, that which was so will be dust and ashes, a thing that creatures composed of the same sort of material, cemented by the same fragile medium of life, will turn from with insect disgust. With this consciousness before me, I will venture, then, to say that I was handsome, if ever I was personally vain, such a folly is amongst those that have left me. However, with some good looks, and some knowledge that I did possess them, it is not very wonderful that I should try to set them off to the best advantage on my return home after a long absence. There might have been a native puppyism in the business. There might be, also, some thought of looking well in the eyes of Helen Arnaud, for even at that early age I had begun to think about her a great deal more than was necessary, and to pamper my imagination with a thousand fine romances which need the lustrous air, the glowing skies, the magnificent scenes of the romance-breathing Pyrenees, to make them at all comprehensible. Certain it is that I did think of Helen Arnaud very often, but never was her idea more strongly in my mind than on that morning when I was awakened for the purpose of bidding adieu to my college studies, and of returning once more to my home, and my parents, and the scenes of my infancy. I am afraid that amongst all the expectations which crowded upon my imagination, the thought of Helen Arnaud was most prominent. At five o'clock precisely, old Houssay, who had been trumpeter to my grandfather's regiment of royalists in the wars of the league, and was now promoted to the high and dignified station of my valet de chambre and gouverneur, stood at my bedside, and told me that our horses were saddled, our baggage packed up, and that I had nothing to do but to dress myself, mount, and set out. He was somewhat astonished, I believe, at seeing me lie, for some ten minutes after he had drawn the curtains, in the midst of meditations which to him seemed very simple meditations indeed, but which were, in fact, so complicated of thoughts and feelings and hopes and wishes and remembrances, that I defy any mortal being to have disentangled the Gordian knot into which I had twisted them. After trying some time in vain, I took the method of that great Macedonian baby, who found the world too small a plaything, and by jumping up, I cut the knot with all its involutions asunder. But my father proceedings greatly increased good master Houssay's astonishment, for instead of contenting myself with my student's dress of simple black, with a low collar devoid of lace, which he judged would suit a dusty road better than any other suit I had, I insisted on his again opening the valise and taking out my very best slashed forepoint, my lace collar, my white buskins, and my gilt spurs. Then, having dressed myself en cavalier parfait, drawn the long curls of my dark hair over my forehead, and tossed on my feathered hat, instead of the prim-looking conceit with which I had covered my head at college, I rushed down the interminable staircase into the courtyard, 
with a sudden burst of youthful extravagance and springing on my horse left poor Houssay to follow as best he might away i went out of pau like a young colt when first freed from the restraint of the stable and turned out to grass in the joy-inspiring fields over hill and dale and rough and smooth i spurred on with very little regard to my horse's wind till i came to the rising ground which presents itself just before crossing the river to reach estelle the first object on the height is the chateau of guarès in which henry the fourth passed the earlier years of his youth and wherein he received that education which gave to the world one of the most noble and generous-hearted of its kings i had seen it often before and i know not what chain of association established itself between my own feelings at the time and the memories that hovered round its old grey walls but i drew in my horse's bridle on the verge and gazed upon the building before me as if interrogating it of greatness and of fame and of the world's applause there was however a chill and a sternness about all that it replied which fell coldly upon the warm wishes of youth it spoke of glory indeed and of honour and the immortality of a mighty name but it spoke also of the dead of those who could not hear who could not enjoy the cheerless recompense of posthumous renown it told too of fortune's fickleness of a world's ingratitude of the vanity of greatness and the emptiness of hope with a tightened bridle and slow pace i pursued my way to estelle and dismounting in the yard of the post-house i desired the saddle to be taken off my horse which was wearied with my inconsiderate galloping up and down hill and to be then placed on the best beast which was disengaged in the stable while this was in execution i walked into the kitchen with some degree of sulkiness of mood at not being able to press out some brighter encouragement from a place so full of great memories as the chateau of Henri IV, and laying my hat on the table i amused myself for some time with twisting the straws upon the floor into various shapes with the point of my sword and then returned to the court to see if i had been obeyed the saddle it is true had been placed upon the fresh horse but just as this was finished a gentleman rode into the yard with four or five servants smooth-faced pink and white lackeys with that look of swaggering tiptoe insolence which bespeaks in general either a weak or an uncourteous lord seeing my saddle on a horse that suited his whim the stranger without ceremony ordered the hostler to take it off instantly and prepare the beast for his use he was a tall elegant man of about forty with an air of most insufferable pride which though ever but tinsel quality at the best shone like gold in the master when compared with the genuine brass of his servants who with their lord dismounted treated the hostler with the sweet and delectable epithets of villain hog slave and ass for simply setting forth that the horse was pre-engaged there have been many moments in my life whether either laziness or good humour or carelessness would have prevented me from opposing this sort of infraction of my prior right but on the present occasion i was not in a humour to yield one step to anybody without seeking my hat therefore i walked up to the cavalier who still stood in the court and informed him that the saddle must not be removed for that i had engaged the horse without turning round he looked at me for a moment over his shoulder and seeing a face fringed by no martial beard yet insolent enough to contradict his will he bestowed a buffet upon it with the back of his hand which deluged my fine lace collar in blood from my nose the soul of lord de bigorre my ancestress who contended for her birthright with a king rose in my bosom at the affront and drawing my sword without a moment's hesitation i lunged straight at his heart the dazzling of my eyes from the blow he had given me just gave him time to draw and parry my thrust or that instant he had lain a dead man at my feet the scorn with which he treated me at first now turned to rage at the boldness of my attack and the moment he had parried he pressed me hard in return thinking doubtless 
soon to master the sword of an inexperienced boy. A severe wound in his sword arm was the first thing that showed him his mistake, and in an instant after, in making a furious lunge, his foot slipped, and he fell, his weapon at the same time flying out of his hand in another direction, while his thunderstruck lackey stood gaping with open mouths and bloodless cheeks, turned into statues by a magical mixture of fright and astonishment. I am ashamed to say that anger overpowered my better feelings, and I was about to wash out the indignity he had offered me in his blood, when I heard someone opposite exclaim, Ha! in an accent both of surprise and reproach. I looked up, and immediately my eyes encountered those of Chevalier de Montenero, standing in the yard, with his arms crossed upon his bosom, regarding us intently. I understood the meaning of his exclamation at once, and dropping the point of my weapon, I turned to my adversary, saying, rise sir and take up your sword he rose slowly and sullenly and while his servants pressed round to aid him returned his blade into its scabbard bending his brows upon me with a very sinister frown we shall meet again young sir said he with a meaning nod we shall meet again where i have better space to chastise your insolence i dare say we shall meet again answered i what may come then god knows and I turned upon my heel towards the chevalier, who embraced me affectionately, whispering at the same time, Wash the blood from your face and mount as quickly as you can. Your adversary is not a man who may be offended with impunity. I did as he bade me, and we rode out of the court together, taking our way onward towards Lourdes. As we went, the chevalier threw back his hat from his face, and with one of those beaming smiles that sometimes lighted up his whole countenance, bestowed the highest praises on my conduct. "'Believe me, my dear Louis,' said he, "'such is the way to pass tranquilly through life. For with courage and skill and moderation such as you have shown to-day, bad men will be afraid to be your enemies, and good men will be proud to be your friends.' He then informed me that my opponent was the famous Marquis de Saint-Brie, who had been strongly suspected in two instances of having used somewhat foul means to rid himself of a successful rival. He prevailed on the Chevalier de Valence to sup with him, proceeded the Chevalier. The supper was good, the wine excellent, the Marquis fascinating, and poor de Valence returned home, believing that he had lost an enemy and gained a friend. Ere he had been half an hour in bed, he called his valet in great agony, and before morning he had lost all his enemies together, and gone to join his friends in heaven. The physician shook his head, but after having had an hour's conversation with the Marquis, he became quite convinced that the poor youth had died from an inflammation. The other is not so distinct a tale, continued the Chevalier, or I have not heard it so completely. But from this man's general character I have no doubt of his criminality, he some years ago proposed to marry the beautiful Henriette de Verne, and offered himself to her father. The old man examined his rents, and finding that he had three hundred thousand livres per annum, he felt instantly convinced the Marquise de Saint-Brie was the most noble-minded, honourable, sweet-tempered, and amiable man in the world, and possessed all these qualities in exactly the proportion of three to one more than the Count de Bagnol to whom he had before promised his daughter, and who had but one hundred thousand livres per annum. His calculation was soon made, and sending for the young count, he informed him that he was not near so good a man as the Marquis de Saint-Brie, and gave him his reasons for thinking so, at the same time breaking formally his former engagement. De Bagnol instantly sent his cartel to the Marquis de Saint-Brie, who accepted it, but named a distant day. Before that day arrived, the young count was accused of aiding the Huguenots at Rochelle, and was arrested, but he contrived to escape and transfer great part of his property to Spain. Now comes the more obscure part of the tale. The marriage of the Marquis with Mademoiselle de Verne approached, and great preparations were made at her father's chateau, but a man was seen lurking about the park who many of the servants recognised at the Count de Bagnol. They were wise, however, and said nothing, 
though it was generally rumoured amongst them that the count had been privately married to their young lady some weeks before his arrest the night however on which monsieur de st brie arrived and which was to precede his marriage by one week an uneasy conscience having rendered him restless he by chance beheld a man descend from the window of mademoiselle de verne's apartment he gave the alarm and with much fury declared he had been cheated deceived betrayed and it then appeared they say that the fair henriette had really married her lover he was now however an exile and a wanderer and her father declared he would have the marriage annulled if the marquis de st brie would but do him the honour to stay and wed his daughter the marquis however sternly refused and that very night departed and took up his lodging in the village hard by the count de bagnol was never heard of more two mornings afterwards there was found in the park of m de verne a broken sword near the spot where it was supposed the lover used to leap the wall the ground round about was dented with the struggling of many feet dyed and dabbled with gore part of a torn cloak too was found and a long train of bloody drops from that place to the bank of the river a peasant also deposed to having seen two men fling a heavy burden into the stream at that spot he would not swear that it was a dead body but he thought it was and what became of mademoiselle de la verne demanded i the countess de bagnol said the chevalier for no doubt remained of her marriage removed or was removed i know not precisely which to a convent where she died about five or six months afterwards the chevalier ceased and we both fell into a deep silence the fate of the two lovers whose story he had just told was one well calculated to excite many of those feelings in my young heart which when really strong do not evaporate in words i could have wept for the fate of the two lovers and my heart burned like fire to think that such base wrong should exist and exist unpunished all the sympathy i felt for them easily changed into indignation towards him whom i looked upon as the cause of the death of both and i regretted that i had not passed my sword through the heart of their murderer when he lay prostrate on the ground before me had i known cried i at length had i known but half an hour ago who was the man and what were his actions yon black-hearted assassin should have gone to another world to answer for the crimes he has committed in this you did wisely to refrain replied the chevalier with a tone of calmness that to my unrepressed heat smacked of apathetic frigidity viewed by an honourable mind my dear louis his very fall covered him with a shield more impenetrable than the sevenfold buckler of a telamon never regret an act of generosity however worthless the object if you act nobly to one that deserves nobly you confer a benefit on him and a benefit on yourself if he be undeserving still the very action does good to your own heart in the present instance had you slain that bad man you would probably have entailed ruin on yourself for ever allied as he is to all the most powerful of the land the direst vengeance would infallibly follow his fall from whatever hand it came and instant flight or certain death must have been your choice even as it is you have called upon yourself the hatred of a man who was never known to forgive when the first heat of his rage is past he may seem to forget the affront he has received but still it will be remembered and treasured up till occasion serves for wiping it out in the most remorseless manner at present i would certainly advise your father to take advantage of the temporary peace that exists with spain and send you into that land till the man you have offended has quitted this part of the country and it is possible you may never meet with him again if you do however beware of his anger believe me it is as imperishable as the fabled wrath of juno i am going to saragossa myself on business of importance and will willingly take all charge of you if you will join me there tell the count what has happened tell him what i say and bid him lose no time i would urge it upon him personally but the affairs that call me into spain admit of no delay End of chapter 4
by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. As the Chevalier concluded, he put his horse into a quicker pace, and in a minute or two after, the road opened out into the beautiful valley of Lourdes. It would be difficult to express the thrilling feelings of exquisite delight with which I beheld again the scenes of my early remembrances. One must be a mountaineer to feel that strange attachment to one particular spot of earth, which makes all the rest of the world but a desert to the heart. I have read a thousand theories by a thousand philosophers, intended to show the latent causes of such sensations, and on comparing them with the living feelings of my own breast, I have found them what I believe the theories of philosophers generally are, chains of reasoning as fragile and unsubstantial, as those links which the children in the country weave out of flowers, graceful in information and apparently firmly united, but with the slightest touch will snap asunder. Such feelings are too fine, too subtle for the grasp of reason. They cannot be analysed, they cannot be described, and even while we experience them, we can render to ourselves no account of why they are felt. The first sight of the castle of Lourdes perched upon its high rock with its battlements and turrets and watch-towers, while the mountains sweeping round it formed a glorious purple background to its bold features, and the sparkling stream seemed playing at its feet. The very first sight made my heart beat like a young lover's, when he sees again, after a long absence, the first inspirer of his airy dreams. Each blue hill, each winding path, each detached rock, each ancient tree, that my eye rested upon was a landmark to guide the wanderer memory back through the waste of years to some joy or some sport or some pleasure long left behind eagerly i followed the chevalier on from one object to another gleaning bright remembrances as i went along while the rapid mind with every footfall of my horse still ran through a thousand associations and came back like light to mark some new theme of memory. Even the dirty little insignificant town of Lourdes had greater charms in my eyes than a city of palaces would at that moment have possessed, and I looked upon all the faces that I saw as if I recognised them for my kinfolk. When we arrived at the market-place, the chevalier, who was about to visit the house of Arnaud, his procureur, left me, and I proceeded alone, riding rapidly on, till the path winding through the narrow gorge beyond lourdes opened out into the wide basin of aguilet i paused for a moment to look over its far extent rich in sunny magnificence all seemed brightness and tranquillity and summer every asperity was smoothed and harmonized and the lustrous purple of the distant air spread a misty softness over each rough feature of the mountains while a thousand blue and indistinct passes wound away on every side, promising to lead to calm and splendid lands beyond. It was like the prospect of life to a young and ardent imagination, before years have clouded the scene or experience has exposed its ruggedness. There was the dazzling misty sunshine with which fancy invests every distant object. There the sweet valleys of repose where we promise ourselves peace and enjoyment, there the mighty steps whereby ambition would mount unto the sky, while the dim passes that branched away on either hand imaged not ill the thousand vague and dreamy schemes of youth for reaching fancied delights which shall never be attained. There were, however, real and substantial joys before me, which I hurried on to taste, and in the expectation of which was mingled no probable alloy although I had been so long absent from my native home. The meeting of long separated friends is rarely indeed without its pain. To mark the ravages that time's deliberate, remorseless hand has worked upon those we love, or see a grace fled, or a happiness, any, any change in what is dear, is something to regret. But I was not at a time of life to anticipate sorrow, and my parents had seen me a pow some four months before, so that but little alteration could have taken place. Nothing, therefore, waited me but delight. My horse flew rather than ran, and the dwelling of my sires was soon within sight. 
I sprang to the ground in the courtyard, and, without a moment's pause, ran up the stairs to my mother's apartments, not hearing or attending to the old maître d'hôtel, who reiterated that she was in the garden. There was delight in treading each old accustomed step, of my infancy of gazing round upon objects every line of which was a memory the gloom of the old vestibule the channelled marble of the grand staircase the immense oaken door of my mother's apartments all called up remembrances of the sweet past and i hurried on gathering recollections till i entered the embroidery room where i had sprung a thousand times to her arms in my early boyhood the only person that i found there was helen she had risen on hearing my step and what was passing in her mind i know not but the blood rushed up through her beautiful clear skin till it covered her whole forehead and her temples with a hue like the rose and i could see her lip quiver and her knees shake as she waited to receive my first salutation i was carried on by the joyful impetus of my return or perhaps i might have been as embarrassed as herself but springing forward towards her without giving myself time to become agitated i kissed the one fair cheek she turned towards me and was going on in the usual form to have kissed the other but in travelling round my lips passed hers and they were so round so full so sweet for my life i could not get any farther and i stopped my journey there helen started back and gazing at me with a look of deep surprise and even distress sunk into the chair from which she had risen at my coming while i with a brain reeling with strange and new feelings and a heart palpitating with i knew not what hurried away to seek my mother unable even to find one word of excuse for what i had done and feeling it wrong very wrong but finding it impossible to wish it undone the garden consisted of about an acre of ground disposed in a long parallelogram and forced into a level much against the will of the mountain which invaded its rectilineal figure with several unmathematical rocks luckily my mother was at the extreme end leaning on the arm of my father who with an affection that the chilly touch of time had found no power to cool was supporting her in her walk with as much attentive kindness as he had shown to his bride on his wedding day i had thus time to get rid of a certain sort of whirl in my brain which the impress of helen's lips had left and to turn the current of my thoughts back to those parents for whom in truth i entertained the deepest affection my mother i found had been ill and was so still though in some degree better so that my sorrow to see her so much enfeebled as she appeared to be together with many other feelings drove my adventure of the morning the marquis de st brie and the advice of the chevalier entirely out of my thoughts till poor Houssay, whom i had left at pau arrived bringing a sadly mangled and magnified account of my rencontre gathered from hostlers and postillions at estelle as his story of my exploits went to give me credit for the death of five or six giants and anthropophagi i thought it necessary to interrupt him and tell my own tale myself the different effects that it produced upon a brave man and a timid woman may well be conceived my father said i had acted right in everything and my mother nearly fainted perceiving her agitation i thought it better to delay the message of the chevalier till dinner when i judged that her mind would be in some degree calmed for she wept over the first essay of my sword as if it had been a misfortune my father and myself conducted the countess to her apartments where helen still sat hardly recovered from the agitation into which i had thrown her on seeing me again she cast down her look and the tell-tale blood rushed up into her cheek so quickly that had not my mother's eyes been otherwise engaged in weeping she must have remarked her sudden change of colour observing the countess's tears helen glided forward and cast her arms round the neck of her patroness saying that she hoped that nothing had occurred to give her alarm or discomfort both helen replied my mother both and then proceeded to detail the whole story foreboding danger and sorrow from my early initiation into strife and bloodshed 
yet although not knowing it my mother i am sure did not escape without feeling some small share of maternal pride at her son's first achievement i saw it in her face i heard it in her tone and often since i have had occasion to remark how like the passions the feelings and the prejudices which swarm in our bosoms are to a large mixed society wherein the news that is painful to one is pleasing to another and joy and sorrow are the results of the same cause at the same moment man's heart is a microcosm the actors in which are the passions as varied as opposed as shaded one into the other as we see the characters of men in the great scene of the world as my mother spoke helen's lovely face grew paler and paler and i could see her full snowy bosom which was just panting into womanhood heave as with some strong internal emotion till at length she suddenly fell back apparently lifeless it was long ere we could bring her back to sensation but when she was fully recovered she attributed her illness to having remained the whole day stooping over a miniature picture which she was drawing of my mother and the countess whose love for her had by this time become nearly maternal exacted a promise from her that she would take a mountain walk every morning before she began her task this may seem a trifle but i have learned by many a rude rebuff to know that there is no such thing as a trifle in this world all is of consequence all may be of import helen's mountain walks sealed my fate at dinner i delivered the message and advice with which the chevalier had charged me and after some discussion it was determined that it should be followed my father at first opposed it and indignantly spurned at the idea of any one attempting injury to the heir of bigor in his paternal dwelling but my mother's anxiety prevailed backed by the advice and persuasions of good father francis of Alurdi, who offered to accompany me for the short time that my absence might be necessary my father soon grew weary of making any opposition and it was agreed that myself father francis and Hussein, my valet should take our departure for spain within two days and joining the chevalier at saragossa should remain there till we received information that the marquis de saint brie had quitted Bern. that day ended and another began and springing from my bed with the vigorous freshness that dwellers in cities never know i took my gun and proceeded to the mountain purposing to search the rocks for an izzard gradually however i became thoughtful and revolving the events just past many a varied feeling rose in my mind and i found that one stirring and active day had changed me more than years of what had gone before that it was in fact my first day of manhood i had staked and won in the perilous game of mortal strife i had shed blood i had passed the rubicon i was a man onward 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 was the cry of my heart i felt that i could not and i wished not that i could go back from that i was to that which i had been and yet there was a great regret a feeling of undefinable clinging to the past a sort of innate conviction that the peaceful the quiet the tranquil was left behind for ever and even while i joyed in the active and gay existence that fancy and hope spread out before me i looked back to the gone and yielded it a sigh for the calm enjoyments that were lost for ever from these ideas my mind easily turned to the latter part of that day which formed the theme of my thoughts and i could not help hoping nay even believing that the fainting of helen arnaud was linked in some degree with concern for me i had remarked the blush and the agitation when i first came i had noted her behaviour on the kiss which i had taken and from the whole i gathered hope yet nevertheless i reproached myself for having used a liberty with her which her dependent situation might lead her to look upon less as a token of love than as an insult and i resolved to justify myself in her eyes and how to justify myself it may be asked by taking that irrevocable step which would clear all doubt from her mind but whether it was solely to efface any bad impression that my conduct might have caused or whether it was that i gladly availed myself of that pretext to act as my heart rather than my reason prompted i cannot tell 
certain it is that i loved her with an ardour and a truth that i did not even know myself and such a passion could not long have been concealed even if the impatience of my disposition had not hurried me on to acknowledge it to her so soon by the time i had taken this resolution i had climbed high amongst the hills and was wandering on upon the rocky ridge that overhung the valley of the garve when i caught a glimpse of some one strolling slowly onward along the path by the riverside it wanted but one look to tell me that it was helen high above her as i was i could distinguish neither her figure nor her face but it mattered not i felt as well convinced that it was she as if i had stood within a pace of her and began descending the rocks as quickly as i could to join her in her walk watching her as i did so to see that she did not turn back before i could reach her after having gone some way up the valley looking back every ten steps towards the chateau as if she had imposed on herself the task of walking a certain distance and would be glad when it was over helen at length seated herself on a piece of rock under the shade of an old oak that started out across the stream and there with her head bent over the running waters she offered one of the loveliest pictures my eyes ever beheld she was as i have said in the spring of womanhood time had not laid his withering touch upon a single grace or a single beauty it was all expanding loveliness that perfect moment of human existence when all has been gained and nothing has been lost when nature has done her utmost and years have yet known nothing of decay i approached her as quietly as i could and when i came near only said helen in a low tone not calculated to surprise her she started up however and the same blush mantled in her cheek which i had seen the day before the good morrow that she gave me was confused enough and in truth my own heart beat so fast that i did not know how to proceed till i saw her about to return to the chateau stay helen said i taking her hand and bringing her again to the rock on which she had been sitting stay for one moment and listen to me for i have something to say to you which perhaps i may never have an opportunity of saying hereafter the colours varied in her cheek like the hues of an evening sky and she trembled very much but she let me lead her back and for a moment raising her eyes from the ground they glanced towards my face from under their long dark lashes with a look in which fear and timidity and love too i thought were all mingled but it fell in a moment and i went on with a greater degree of boldness for all that love well i believe are in some degree cowards and but gain courage from the fears of those they seek to win there is a secret helen i said assuming as calm a tone as i could which i cannot go into spain without communicating to some one as it is one of the greatest importance and i have fixed upon you to tell it to because i am sure you will keep it well and truly without indeed i added i were by any chance to die in spain when you may freely reveal it nay more i request you would do so to both my parents helen was deceived and looked up with some degree of curiosity brushing back the dark ringlets from her clear fair brow will you promise me helen i asked by all you hold most sacred never to reveal my secret so long as i am in life had you not better make some other person the depository of so serious a trust she answered half afraid half curious still think count louis i am but a poor inexperienced girl tell it to father francis he will both respect your secret and counsel you as to your actions he will not do i replied besides he is going with me will you promise me helen it is necessary to my happiness oh then i will replied she with a tone and a look that went to my very heart and had almost made me cast myself at her feet at once you must know then helen i proceeded that there is on this earth one sweet girl that i love more than any other thing that it contains while i spoke she turned so deadly pale that i thought she was going to faint again listen to me helen i continued rapidly listen to me dear helen 
I love her, I adore her, and I would not offend her for the world. If, therefore, I pained her for one instant by robbing her lips of a kiss in the full joy of my return, I am here to atone it by any penance which she may think fit to impose. While I spoke, my arm had glided round her waist, and my hand had clasped one of hers. Helen's head sunk upon my shoulder, and she wept so long that I could have fancied her deeply grieved at the discovery of my love, but that the hand which I had taken remained entirely abandoned in mine, and that from time to time she murmured, "'Oh, Louis!' in a voice indistinct to anything but the ears of love. At length, however, she recovered herself and raised her head, though she still left her hand in mind. "'Oh, Louis,' she said, "'you have made me both very happy and very unhappy. "'Very happy because I am sure that you are too generous, "'too noble to deceive, even in the least, "'a poor girl that doubts not one word from your lips. "'But I am very unhappy to feel sure, as I do, "'that neither your father nor your mother will ever consent "'that you should wed any one in the class bourgeoise, even though it were their own little Helen, on whom they have already showered so many bounties. It cannot be, indeed it cannot be. The very mention of it would make them wretched, and that must never happen, on account of one who owes them so deep a debt of gratitude. I tried to persuade her, as I had persuaded myself, that in time they would consent. But I failed in the endeavour, and as the first agitation subsided and she began to reflect upon her situation at the moment, she became anxious to leave me. Let me return home, she said, and, oh, Louis, if you love me, never try to meet me in this way again, for I shall always feel like a guilty thing when I see your mother afterwards. I have your secret, and as I have promised, I will keep it. You have mine, and let me conjure you to hold it equally sacred. Forget poor Helen, Arno, as soon as you can, and marry some lady in your own rank, who may love you, perhaps, as... The tears prevented her going on. Never, Helen, never, exclaimed I, still holding her hand. Stay yet one moment. We are about to part for some months. Promise me before I go, if you would make my absence from you endurable, that sooner or later you will be my wife. No, Louis, no answered she firmly, that I will not promise, for I will never be your wife without the consent of your parents. But I will promise, she added, seeing that her refusal to accede to what I ask had pained my impatient spirit more than she expected. I will vow, if you require it, never, never to be the wife of another. With these words she withdrew her hand and left me, turning her step towards the chateau, while I, delighted to find myself loved, yet vexed she would not promise more, darted away into the hills, and, as if to escape the pursuit of feelings, which, though in some degree happy, were still too strong for endurance, I sprang from rock to rock after the izzards with agility and daring, little less than their own, making the crags ring with my carbine, till I could return home sufficiently successful in the chase to prevent any one supposing I had been otherwise employed. End of chapter 5